is Adam Klein, Global Graduate Director, Faculty Member at New Ventures West. This is Episode 10 of our podcast, Stepping In, a podcast where we delve into how integral coaching can address some of the most pressing issues we face as individuals, as communities, and as stewards of our planet. In this episode, I sit down to talk with Susan Olasek. Susan is a facilitator, coach, and consultant who uses the Enneagram, a system of personal development, in her work with corporations, individuals, and students. She's also the founder of the Enneagram Prison Project, a program which brings Enneagram teachers into prisons to work with the incarcerated. Their goal is to reduce recidivism rates while at the same time improving the interpersonal lives of those behind bars. The Enneagram Prison Project has run programs in places such as San Quentin Maximum Security Prison, Elmwood Correctional Facility, Santa Clara Jail, and Folsom State Prison. I started this conversation with Susan by asking her to give me an overview of how she understands the Enneagram. Well, it took me, I think, 10 years to have an elevator pitch about the Enneagram. I think that it's, um, it's such a complicated system in some ways, but as I learned it more, it, it simultaneously gets more complex and simpler. The Enneagram is this profound psychological system that helps us to see these repeating patterns of um, of our thoughts, repeating um, emotional feelings we have, and then repeating patterns of our behavior. And then collectively, we call that our personality. So I, I know that we can't change things that we can't see. So the Enneagram is, acts like a map of these egoic, patterns that we all are operating under that mostly though we don't know and I've had um, a lot of people tell me oh, if I knew the Enneagram when I was young but when we're young is when these patterns are starting to really form and um, I think actually they're formed they're even before we're born a lot of these patterns are, are in us and biologically and, and then our environment compounds things and then we end up seeing things a certain way and then behaving as a result of how we see things. And, um, but sometimes it doesn't feel safe. You know, when we're growing up, we don't really feel totally like our knees are going to get met or, or sometimes we have really hard childhoods. And so um, depending on how we come out of our childhood is how defended we are um, from being able to access the best of ourselves. And um, the patterns form around that. So, no matter what, everybody's got a personality, last I checked. But in the beginning, when I, I, I heard about that, it was from a parenting teacher, and it was a very foreign concept to me. I didn't understand how that was, and I was actually a brand-new mom. And I actually had this thought, I'm a type one, right, so I'm an idealist. I thought, well, if I could just raise my children in a way where they weren't, um, you know, too, they weren't too um, impacted by reality really like they didn't have all these hard things happen in their lives then they wouldn't develop a personality but if you take that to its logical conclusion that's really scary we need our personalities the Enneagram just helps us to see what's going on um, and what's the what's the potential gift that we're really not accessing in ourselves yeah so one of the things that I'm appreciating in my understanding of the Enneagram and what you're bringing forward is a word you used a couple of times system but it's a system to work with as opposed to, you know, different kinds of what personality assessments that are kind of like tools that I'd help us identify something and then to work with it, but that this is a system of understanding and a system for identifying and then a, a map as you're saying. Well, I, yeah, just to kind of riff off of what you're saying that we need a system because we ourselves are systems. We are complicated and there are a lot of things going on inside of ourselves so the Enneagram is multifaceted has many many elements to it um, and in that way it can be a great tool but it's not just that for me I think that the Enneagram has is very incisive I, I use that word a lot because it really does get right to the heart of what's going on um, in the core way that we are um, oriented the core beliefs that we hold as what we believe to be really true and when you land, when anyone lands in the type that really is their personality type structure, um, it's very, it's, it's almost too illuminating for some people. I, I can tell them 
we've gotten into the accurate type for somebody or their territory when they close the book and they're like, oh my God, how'd you know that about me? You know, it's, it's really revealing when, we, when it comes right down to it, but not but, and I think so, for that very reason, many people say, you've got to be careful with this tool. You know, it's a sacred system. You can't just put it anywhere. It has, has to be um, shared with a lot of care. And I, I truly feel that. I bring a lot of care in bringing the system in. I, I don't feel like it's a quick fix because, uh, you know, we've, we've been working with our personalities for a very long time. And um, it, I like to work with places that are willing to give the Enneagram a long stretch to allow people to see themselves, allow them to stay with what they see and allow them to revisit what they see so that eventually they can have some, some shifts and change, which is why I think most people want to look at the Enneagram in the first place. But I am about 150 feet deep with any in prison project, and I, it consumes a lot of my time and a lot of my passion because it's so satisfying to work with people who are really at the bottom of who they take themselves to be and are really frustrated or hurting and tired of doing things that got them in so much trouble where they're sitting behind bars. And um, yeah, I, I just really love that part of what I'm, what I'm up to. One of the things that I'd love to hear how you view this is, so the Enneagram and you know what you've been saying is a way of understanding our personality so we can see through our patterns and understand our behaviors and what has us react in certain ways. So, so who is it then that's observing and seeing these things? Well, I think that's the good news. <laughs> yeah. Who is that actually, right? That's the golden question. Right. Yeah. Well, people call it a lot of things that higher self or Buddha nature, Christ consciousness or inner observer. Um, I don't care what you call it. I just want you to know that you have that part of you that I do, that we all do. We all have that inner observer in us, but we mostly don't realize that because we aren't taught to, to pause. We aren't often, t um, I was never taught how to do that. Uh, and now I have some of the work that I've seen in, you know, companies have meditation rooms and schools pause to meditate. And instead of getting sent to the office, some kids go and sit on a cushion like, this is cool. But we're starting to be aware of in our consciousness. And that is a, quite a like mind-blowing thing when people get a hold of that. And I feel like um, no matter where I, I teach, I think when people are really game to look at this invitation, uh, they remind me of kids. People get really... Uh, I don't know, innocent looking childlike when they're, they, they kind of go, Oh wow, I don't have to do it that way. And um, I, I remember not that long ago having a conversation with my 12 year old in the kitchen and his 17 year old brother was egging him on and he was exasperated. So my oldest, my middle son is a type eight, my younger guy is type three. And so they're two assertive types, right. And they can really, you know, go, go around and around with each other. And, um, and I, and anyway, I was having a conversation with my youngest and I, I said, well, can you find a different way to respond to him? And he looked at me, he goes, no, he's doing this to me. Like what other way could I possibly be? And I was thinking, well, it kind of can feel like that when we're, when we're in it, we just think, no, there is no other way. And if I'm a one, I'm going to fix you. And if I'm a three, I'm going to go over you. Right. And if I'm a, Eight, I'm going to take over and, um, and it's so it's so logical the gift that we have and what we bring to bear and how we can bring what we know and then it's such I think uh, it's so admirable when people go oh well maybe I could do something different and um, I do feel that these are prisons that we make for ourselves because we become so committed to repeating the thing that we know and um, it is really courageous to be open-minded enough to recognize that that's not working. That maybe the thing that I am ins have been insisting on, think about how much ego this is, but for 45 years, or some of my students are 70 years, right? Didn't work. And how much ego it takes to put down, how much inner strength it takes to put down that ego and say, could it be another way? But I, I also think the uh, really important element to it is compassion, self-compassion because we, um, we come by our personalities very innocently as kids, as just in response to our environment. I know that. Right. So um, 
if we're unwilling to, to give something up, it's because we have good reason to believe that it's helped us. We don't want to that quickly. Right. Right. Yeah. And in your work, so you mentioned this, so part of your work is doing this in prisons with people. Right. And one of the things I'm curious about is what you find, you know, what first comes to mind when you think about like, what is unique about working in that context? Like what becomes available to people when you bring in the Enneagram that you haven't seen so available, like resource wise or openness or whatever it might be when you're working in that context. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are you seeing there that would, we could all learn from? Well, I mean, the obvious is that the environment is so different. And if you um, ever set foot in an institution, you'll know that some are harsher than others, but um, you know, there's big, heavy steel metal doors and clanging locks and, lots of restrictions and, um, you know, circumstances where you can be in the middle of teaching and then all of a sudden there's a lockdown and everybody disappears and two minutes you're gone. And it's that, it, it can definitely be that, but I will, I really want people to know that it is by and large, not all that, you know, that can, that can be a piece of teaching, but mostly, um, what's different is the, um, the immediate, like they, they would say the, the hunger for the teaching. And I teach in a lot of places. I teach with corporate teams that are there because the CEO or the VP or whoever thought it would be a great thing for their team and people come. And now those people do not have as much volition. <laughs> they don't get to choose. And so in some ways, I think they're harder crowds to and bring into that invitation because they haven't necessarily decided they want to be there in the first place. But even so, I think that most people are willing to um, suspend what they know enough to, to be curious. So I would say the, um, the people in my classes, they've already been all the way down to the bottom of themselves. Some of them have done horrible, horrible things in, because of how much personal pain they've been in. And that got them, you know, 30 years in prison. And some of them have been in there 30 years before I even meet them. Some of them have been in there 30 days in jail. So, so it's a real variety of people that I get to work with. Um, so I would say those are, those are two big things, the environment and their, where they are inside of themselves before they get into the room. Those are, those are um, perhaps quite different. And where they are inside of themselves, what kind of things do you, do you see when you bring in the Enneagram? What type of things are possible because of that? Yeah. Well, I have two different groups inside of the jail and prison populations that I get to work with now. And um, we have, I mean, jails and prisons are, are big. There's a lot of people in them. So even if we're teaching a class, we only have maybe between 20 and 60 people in a class. Uh, so there's a lot of people in the jail and prison that haven't seen it. So I, when I get a, I call like a virgin class and they've never heard of the Enneagram, it's kind of hard to find those in where we are right now because word has traveled and those, um, those wisdom of the Enneagram books get all circulated around. It's hard for us to get all the books back. And we had, we were teaching on one floor in this jail in downtown San Jose and somebody from the fifth floor, like a different floor, um, contacted their mom who wrote to me. Like it just, it's interesting how it travels. So, but every once in a while we get a brand new class of people are like, any old, what, what, the, what is this thing? Is this the devil? Like they, it's all the traditional, like, you know, regular questions you would get. And I really delight in those kinds of classes because, uh, any, but I don't have much skepticism and I don't have nearly the self-doubt that I once did when I was teaching a new group of people. Um, so I just love to un unpack what I know with a ton of heart and a lot of love and watch them get curious and watch them find themselves. And I think that's so, um, so fun. But a lot of the classes we've been in the jails and prison now for a couple of years, and um, they do the, a lot of the recruiting for us. So when people come in, by and large, many people have heard something. Some of them have already found their type. They they got the book from their friend, and they're they're interested. They might still have some of their skepticism, and 
once in a while we have people like this new version class I just finished. They they said, well, I was here because I needed another certificate. I was getting into court and I didn't have any certificates. And mm -hmm. so I just thought this would be a good one to have. And I say, thank you. I'm so glad I welcome your honesty. I really like to know that that's where you're at. But honestly, um, so even people that start in the beginning with as dubious as they are, their arms folded or what have you, or they just are there for the certificate. Um, I haven't had anybody take the class. I haven't had anybody take the whole class at the end and say this was a waste of my time. I have had a guy even very recently who said, I didn't pick this class. I wanted to be in a different class. My, you know, rehabilitation officer put this class on my docket and told me it would be a good class for me. And he was very much like arms folded, didn't want to be there. And he was a two, is a two. Um, and um, he would fall asleep in my class. And I, I, at first, you know, I was like, hmm, this is kind of a tough guy. But then he sat on panel as a two. And I heard about his early childhood. And um, I heard he was incredibly spoiled. That's how he described himself, that he just got everything he, and stuff he never asked for. He got everything except for his parents. He just got all this stuff. And I find, he taught me about how that kind of thing so... Um, spoiled with material things is so harmful to our hearts, right? Because it's like three, twos, threes, and fours really wrestle with this sense of worth and undeservedness. And it created so many identity issues for him. He was, he was, and he was so angry about that. Um, and he, um, he shared a lot about that. So, Anyway, he, he kept how pleased I was that he kept showing up, and he really didn't know what to do with that, I think, for a long time, because I wanted him to know that because he was there, it was his choice to be there, and truly it was, but he really wanted it to be somebody made him do something, and I think having, having empowerment is what we all really want. We all really want to know that we're in charge of ourselves, and in prison and jail, I guess this is another big difference. They feel so completely powerless and disempowered. And I let people know this is a system about having your own personal power. Who doesn't want that? Everybody wants that. So what you just said sparked in me, like who doesn't want to have like some kind of personal power? And what I'm sensing into is like the distinction between well, power and like the, free, the freedom that power, the power that comes with feeling free or seeing possibility. But then also the other side of it where we can be, <clears throat> where we can feel like we have power, but it's just our personality running us. So we are, we are having like trying to have power over our situation so that it can feed our preferences, feed our personality preferences, and how that can prop us up for decades. Right. And so we never actually get in contact with how we're just propping ourselves up. Right. And some of what I'm hearing you say and what happens in prison is that's that, that, um, that path has come to an end. There's no more propping up. You've reached the end of that. And now you have a choice. Yeah. Well, you have, or you haven't because there are people that spend their entire life in prison and they are very much, you know, still in the grips of all of that. I think this is the part where particularly in San Quentin, where we're programming now, these are men who have, really done a lot of time like I've been sharing and um, and they've done a lot of programming too frankly there's some excellent programs in San Quentin there's higher education and there's you know um, a lot of ways for them to see some of the same exact things that you and I are talking about with just different tools and, and ways of looking so I feel like we're all partners in there trying to support our clients to have another way of hearing something about themselves. And I also don't think there's anything quite like the Enneagram. I haven't found it, but it so systematically helps us to see those, those different parts. And so I, I like what you're talking about too, Adam, that the, the sense of power that we have, I think it's, um, I work with a coach and she, she talks about it being an alignment, right? It's not a power center, it's an, a, it's an alignment to self, to source, to God or higher power, whatever you call that. And when we're really connected to ourselves, we can, we can do so much, even if we have to sit in a cell. You know, we, 
we can really hold on to ourselves. And um, I, so two things I want to say, I'm going to help me get back to my train of thought if I forget it. That one, one, one is that not that long ago, there was a lockdown at San Quentin that went on for like a month. And um, it was really hard on me because I love to go to that class and <clears throat> it was hard for me to, I can't communicate with anybody. Obviously we finally got in, I think it was a month. It might've been five or six weeks. And, um, and I was saying to the guys as they were coming in, oh my God, how are you? How are you? I missed you. Are you all right? You know, and they were, they were happy. The lockdown let up at noon and I was there at six o'clock at night and the, the evening was warm and beautiful and the sun was setting and guys were coming in. And then we formed our circle and I went around thinking I was going to really be holding the space. And it was like, you know, the first day of summer to, to the ways, the way it felt in the room, everyone with the exception of one or two people were just full of gratitude for the break that they had had. And they were so um, appreciative of the time they had to rest. This is a really highly programmed prison. And these men are busy. They have a lot of things they're doing, multiple classes, you know, facilitating things on their own getting degrees and one guy said he wrote 70 pages of legal briefs that he was trying to put together and another person said he caught up on all of his mail another person watched all of his favorite shows and you know these are people that lead busy lives just like you and me and I was so like I want to say humble it was really kind of humiliated I felt like inside feeling like how did I project I did not get the um that about them and how how if you can really be with yourself, then you're actually great company. And that's a very, very powerful place to be. Now, I think many people, and if we took cross-section of people in Silicon Valley and we put them in lockdown in a, whatever it is, a seven by 11 foot cell for six weeks with another person that you may or may not love the company of, we would be hard pressed to be that full of gratitude at the end of that. So personal empowerment, they're already there. They, they come into the room with a ton, many of them. And some of them have never done much programming, but by and large, a lot of people have. And then when they get a hold of the Enneagram, they go, oh my God, now I see. I see even more how I can harness this inside of myself. And the, like you said, the imitation, the personality is so not the same thing, but it feels like it, which is why it's so hard to give up. So we're so fiercely addicted to our personalities. Because our, we have like this dopamine hit that's wired into our type structure. So if I'm a type one and I am, and I, I definitely still guilty of this. If I clean something that's really been bugging me and it's all a lot organized and, you know, orderly, uh, I like to walk by that thing a couple of times a day and take a look at it. It makes me feel good. And I know my brain does something or I get a little hit. I went into Whole Foods the other day and I was, I bought all these vegetables that they had made for me. And as I was leading the checker, I said, what a healthy meal. And I replayed that in my head all the way to the parking lot, right? Like that's in me. And, um, and it's addictive, right? It makes me want to go back to Whole Foods and have somebody tell me what a good girl I was, right? It's like, oh, that's ego. That's all, that's ego. Yeah. And um, so it's so alluring to, to get those hits. But when we are simply still and we don't have to do a thing to feel our own goodness and know our own worth, that's really a different kind of intoxication. And that we find behind bars. Yeah. So I have a, along those lines, what are some indicators for you that you have for yourself <clears throat> or that you uh, invite other people to know the difference. Like how do you know the difference between when it's just like a dopamine hit or your personality being supported versus the other thing that you talked about being in alignment or being in contact with um, a more true self, which when I say true, meaning like not that it's more true than your personality, but that it's more, it includes more. So it's more inclusive. It's not, that the other self is false. It's just, it's an over identification with personality. Right. But how, how do you help people discern what's what? Right. That's a really cool question. I think it's an inside job. <laughs> and I think it really is a matter of how it feels to each of us. 
if I'm a three, I need to go succeed one more time. I need to go fix, you know, fig do one more project. And we always need another hit. Uh, so that's one way of telling. And, you know, ego just never feels good. It never feels good the way being completely present feels so good. And it's a discernment. I, I tell you, right, for, and I, I think this is why it's so tricky, because some of the types are egocentric types. It feels good to be that type. You're one of them, right? You're seven. Feels good to be a seven, right? Life's fun. Yeah, it, yeah. It could be a dangerous type to be because of that. <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. And so, and a two is another one, maybe. You know, life feels good to help people. Feels really good. Um, and then there are other types that are sort of dystonic. Doesn't feel that good to to be a one. I think a lot of times very hard inside. It's not fun. It's my my I revert to it being hard work. And type six can be very hard in there. Like look, always looking out for the danger. It doesn't feel so good inside of six. But all the types have the capacity and the potential to. Christians call it convert our energy to its opposite tendency. I like the word to transform it. And we can, we only have so much energy available to us, but we can do something really cool with that energy. And once once people start to get onto the fact that that's all inside of me, and it doesn't actually matter where I am, I can do that. Um, then. See, it's a hard question to answer, actually. I'm realizing it's how you've asked that. So that's why it's such a good one. Well, yeah, that's why I wanted to, like, we'll see what Susan has to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's helpful because as you're talking, it's illuminating things for me. Like, what, so how would I answer this question? And part of what I heard you saying, and this is where the Enneagram can be helpful, is that it can start to illuminate when is it that my personality is being fed versus something more core or more true. Okay. Um, and the, the Enneagram identifies those things for us to say, if this is what's, if this is your core type. So for me, I'm a, a seven. So if it's like more shiny objects or more things that like cause excitement and that's what you feel like is feeding you, then pay attention to that because that may be your personality right. that's being fed versus something that's more true about you, your more essential self. Right. Um, which Yes, can also be fed by those things, but doesn't feel so, and this is, I think, one of the things that was coming up for me is, does it feel so addicted to being fed by that? Or feeling like I always have to move away from myself internally to these external things to keep me propped up. Right. Um, and the Enneagram, I think, helps with that to, to see what is, it, what is it at our pattern that is like keeping us fed. And then the other thing, I, th I don't know if this is true for all types, but it's certainly true for me that I can, one of the ways I can feel the difference is when my personality is being fed, I feel like it help it contributes to me feeling separate from other people because it's, it's reifying this like individualism and this, like I am my own thing and I am separate from everybody else versus when it's my essential self that is being tuned into I feel much more connected to other people and included right. because I don't need to separate myself because I feel safe secure comfortable and not threatened by somebody else's brilliance right. or somebody else's pain for that matter that it doesn't throw me off so that's another thing that occurs for me about telling the difference between like is it when is it personality and when is it more essential self that we're feeling into or sensing and knowing the difference. Does right. And I think for all of us, it's a discernment, isn't it? You know, we're always in each moment discerning and how much of, you know, am I leaning one way or the other? Because we, you can't do away with the personality you wouldn't want to. We need it. It's very useful. But as I, Russ Hudson has said so many times, it's limited. You know, it's, it's limited. So when am I, if I'm a, to when am I when am I helping? And because I just have this heart that was so designed to love. And when am I looking for the feedback that I'm so lovable? You know, that's the discernment. So the Enneagram is a, a invitation to the inquiry. Because <laughs> a lot of people are, you know, we tell people to change, or maybe somebody even wants to change, but they don't know what to change. What am I looking at? Right. Right. 
Yeah, I, think, I, I appreciate so Russ's sentiment, or not sentiment, but speaking about it being limited. The other thing that I am appreciating about as the Enneagram has evolved, at least uh, in my understanding, it's becoming less of a, well, here's all the, here's your personality and why you should feel bad about yourself. And moving to, here are the patterns to pay attention to that could get you caught up in seeing yourself as such a narrow being when there's actually a lot more going on. Right. So uh, less of a tool of like self-flagellation, like, oh, there I go again, and more of a like, oh, here I go, and what else is possible now? What can right. I expand into? Right. It's so reassuring to hear you say that. We really um, start off every class by telling people, this is a system about what's right with you. And we, our goal, for the, especially from the first class, is to let people fall in love with all the types and remember the great things about them because inevitably people bring all the crappy stuff in no problem we don't need we don't need any help with that like right, so right. I spend a lot of time on the front end helping people to see what the gift of that type is and um and it, especially in prison people have just been told so many different things that are wrong with them and I think they're so sort of confused in the beginning like how come how come you're saying all that like don't you know the rest about this guy or don't you know what he did and they're like yeah we but we're both, right? We're light and darkness. So our attention goes to what we give it. So we always start with the light. I'm glad mm -hmm. that you are bringing that up. I think it's sort of the unfortunate part of where the Enneagram has landed that inevitably the books are filled with all the dysfunction and the distortion because it's unconscious, right? We, <laughs> we, don't, we don't know that that's why it's running us. That's why those books need to have all of that in them. But um, there's a lot of goodness in people. Right, right. One way I think about it is it's because it's what's so dominant. Our dominant experience is our personality. So if we point that out, then I hope the idea is, in my sense anyway, is that then what's underneath starts to become illuminated. Because if, if this isn't, if personality isn't the end, then what else is there? And that's my sense of the Enneagram. It's like, this is what you think is everything, and it's not. There's more. So get to know what you think is everything and then start to look around in the dark places of what else uh, you are as a human being, like what other capacities you have with you right? and begin to live into those. And then little bits of space can happen between you and your personality where it's not running you, but you can use it as a tool in the world. Yeah. And I love uh, one, one thing I'm thinking of as you're talking is there's a, um, there's a lovely man in one of our classes, and he's an older man. He just turned 70. And he's done a lot of time. And he came into the class very skeptical, like kind of arms folded and didn't really know why I was there, but he was voluntary. So he, something, I said, something got you in the room. And we have an assignment where we ask people to write a biography in the third person, straight out of the wisdom of the Enneagram book, this assignment. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, this man really negotiated that he didn't want to do it and I told him and he said to me um when I was collecting them from people who had done it you know I know you people I know you people come in you say you're going to do nothing you're not going to do anything with this but I know better and I said you do and I don't I don't know what happened to give you how much you know but you do and you can trust that like you don't have to do this and um, I really respect that. But if you're not going to write it down, I am going to invite you to participate in class. You don't have to write it down, but you're not going to get anything out of it if you don't share it in some way. So he did a little bit at a time. And I found that if I say yes to wherever somebody is and just accept them, that was where he was, then maybe there could be some movement. And this is a long class, 16 weeks, right? So he just kept coming back. And each time he'd like, he, he thought he was one type and he landed on a type. And... Um, and at some point, close to the end, I was collecting these biographies kind of trickle in because some people write 20 pages double-sided. Some people write, you know, very little. And um, I walked by him and he ha handed, out, handed me a biography. And I looked at it, it was five lines and this very um, noble, shaky handwriting. And it said three events that had happened to him and um, one conclusion. And it was quite a contribution. And I looked at him and I said, is this a biography? And he smiled and he goes, yes, it is. And I said, well, thank you for this. This is a gift. 
and then he had this little twinkle and it makes me tearful just to think about this man he's like he's so precious and then each of the last few weeks he he was starting to say things like um i never been in a class that felt like this i never had a feeling like this and um and then and then one day he said it's my birthday and i was like wow we have to sing you happy birthday so we did and he i don't know what this guy really got out of his type but he got something out of his humanity and on the last day of class he came up to me and he said i have something for you but you can't look at it until you leave and i said okay and i came out and it was I, I, if i had it handy i would just go get it to show you it was this um almost like a monet like he'd done a, a, a drawing with little pen dots and it's beautiful it's this incredible scene mm. and i and then we had an event in the chapel and he came by and i and he, he just and then the next class that came in so he brought a guest and he said this is a friend of mine and i told him he needs to be in this class and he's not taking the class again himself but something transpires when we start with the positive you know when we just allow people to show up as they are and we accept what we see and carl rogers says if we just gave people a, a moment of positive human regard like if we just spend time with the the one quality that's true it can't be bs right it can't be something that you just say something nice but if you know somebody's type or if you're just present to the way somebody shows up i find they show you their real qualities in little windows and that and I was just thinking about that as you're talking. It's cool when that happens, you know. Yeah, well, you've said it a few times about that it's working with discernment, like discerning the difference between personality and more essential self. So there's this, it's difficult to describe, this feeling quality of something that happens when you start engaging with the inner work of even just asking the question, which is which? And the our feeling of ourselves, our experience of ourselves can start to change. We had a, somebody came into one of our classes one time, it was a, a graduation, meaning it was a culmination of the, the number of weeks. And um, it was like, she said, well, I thought you'd have like cake and cookies and I thought you'd do something like that. But um, it, was, it wasn't that. It's like going around the circle and saying, what is different? For you now than what it was 16 weeks ago and people said things like I, I mean it's like out of the book i didn't know what freedom was i feel a emancipation these are some of their words inside of myself now that i didn't think i would ever have and you can't script stuff like that and there's no cake that's any better than that you know that's that's what happens at the end of those classes and then it just builds on that and and it can it goes on and on and on right like we're never ever done we just keep coming up against ourselves in different ways and then we learn how to work with it another more of our capacity well one of the questions i had was just to give you space to tell stories of like you've just done the last couple here but are there any other stories that come to mind that you want to share about your work with the Enneagram and what you've seen happen as a result of it and or anything along those lines? So many people are on my heart when I finish a class. Um, right now, like I said, we're always working with different uh, populations and one of the populations we get to work with are, is in the main jail in San Jose, Santa Clara actually. And the men in our program are um, young. It's a maximum security jail. And some of them are, are in for very severe crimes. Some of them are looking at a ton of time in for murder. And they're waiting for court. They're waiting to have their cases be completed. And some of them are waiting to go on to prison. And um, it's, I have to say, it's kind of heartbreaking work in some ways because um, the men in this class are my son's age, are the 19 year old, and that he could be in there like that. Uh, uh, I, I sort of never forget that when I'm, when I'm with them because they're so young. Um, but they're, they're remarkable because 
I don't know. I don't know if sometimes if it's like just remarkable to me. So it's a help, it's kind of fun to be able to tell you the story. You let me know if it strikes you in the same way. But I think particularly this one guy is a type nine, and my son is a type nine, and um, he shows um, he he showed up always very nine ish, happy, kind of round, very. Um, uh, last to speak, if at all, easy to kind of blend in, wouldn't make any waves. A lot of the other guys in this class, and they are, they are, they are right off the street, many of them, you know, and some of them enough in and out of prison and jail already many times. They're, they're tough. And um, there's a lot of energy in the room. Like I said, they haven't had a lot of different programs, and a lot of times people's legs are shaking up and down, you know, because you can feel how there's there's trauma and there's things that haven't been explored in them. And um, this one sweet little nine just impressed on me. Like he he didn't make a big deal out of himself, and um, he showed up on the last class talking about we were taught we were trying to think, help them to um, discern what their ego says to them versus what else, what high, what the higher part of them says to themselves. And just to isolate that voice that says that thing to me. And um, this is like such a poignant story exactly, Adam, but just the fact that he said, well, I really, um, I always just don't get in the way of it with other people. I, um, I don't like to, as, as, make things a very big deal. I'm really, I always make things nice for other people, make it feel okay for everyone else. He's such the, the quintessential peacemaker. And um, at the end of the class, I think almost even to the very last minute, we're still making it a working experience for them because um, I feel like we're like squeezing out the last bit of possibility for, to have them know that's not you. <laughs> that's not you. Right. And um, I guess what I'm trying to say about this guy is that he was, it was hard to get a lot out of who he was other than the personality because how much a nine shows up as not a big deal. It's hard to um, get them to show up with much more than, get him to show up with much more than that. But what I could feel that was true about him in our closing circle, I said to him, which is that, you know, you are so intelligent, aren't you? Like you know so much more than you ever, ever say. And you sit there with all this knowing and you are afraid to make, a, make it any big thing. So you, you don't. And he got still and he said very little, but he kind of gave me this head nod. And I said, um, you remind me of my son. And I asked him how old he was. And he said 19. And I said, if you could just take that and see how wise you are and how much you have to share just by taking a little risk every day by, sh by opening your mouth and putting your opinion in and inserting yourself. And as I'm saying that, he's kind of getting a bigger, a little bit bigger grin. And I don't know who, I, who said it, but maybe it's in Sandra Matri's, Matri's book. She talks about the, like, inside of every nine is a little three that's pissed that everybody else is getting all the attention, right? And we do that to ourselves. If, if I'm a nine, I'm not putting myself in there. And so I'm angry that people don't notice me, but I have to be grab the three in me and show up in my right action and say what I have to say. And, um, and just in him sitting there in front of us and, and kind of smiling, other people were processing what their egos say. And one person said, well, it's really hard for me. And um, I, I don't always want to share what I feel. Um, and I keep a lot of things inside of me. And I said, well, who is a safe place, safe person for you to talk to? And he thought about it for a while. And then he said, this man's name, I'll call him uh, Jose. And uh, he said, I, I, I would, I would talk to Jose. And then as the room went around, a couple other people said, I would talk to Jose. <laughs> so we were putting them up on the board about like resources that we have. And I was like, look, Jose, you're quite a resource. So just <sighs> organically, I find that the classes in this one in particular, they really want to support each other. They are so helpful to each other. And they I are all that each other has in some ways. 
Um, and But when they recognize that they have themselves and that when they have more of themselves, they're more for each other, that's a profound moment. Yeah, striking up to me how you were tuning into something below his personality, which had him be, like you were saying, like reined in and not speaking up, but knowing enough about him and sensing that there's a voice inside of him that does know things about himself and everybody else and that is smart but it's been so covered up by personality that it's really small and quiet and how when you how when we and you in this case and all of your wonderful work when you start to pay attention to that little voice how it can start to you did people can't see this but you did this you start to sit up because it feels like, oh, I'm being seen and, oh, I do have something to say here. I do have something to contribute. It's not something that I have to keep under wraps, but that this does need a way of being outwardly expressed. Right. See, hearing you say that part back, it's like um, I'm realizing that in in sitting up like that, that's our dignity, right? That's that's what the pain of the mind is. I don't have my autonomy. I don't have my own dignity. And I can give that to myself by dignifying myself in my own wisdom and sharing that in this moment. I, I can do that. It's powerful. Thank you for listening to another episode of the podcast Stepping In. Thank you also to my guest, Susan. To learn more about her and the Enneagram Prison Project, visit enneagramprisonproject.org. Please spread the news by sharing this podcast on social media and let us know what you think by emailing us at steppingin at newventureswest.com. Until next time, take care.